All right, welcome back. This is Christian Bible Chapel from our earlier service here. All right, and we got that. Okay. All right. All right. We 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 thank the Lord. We're continuing in our discipleship class. We're looking at now the golden chain of salvation. Now. In this, we're, we're going to deal with how that within salvation, there are certain teachings that are chained together. Now, in a chain, they're locked. Each link is connected to another link, which make up a long chain. Right. We use it as an example that salvation consists of various teachings, not to bring about salvation, but it is the results of salvation. The outcome, the beginning, and the outcome, and the results, and all that in one, the golden chain of, of salvation. Our text is in Romans chapter 8. Let's get there. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 28. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you once again as we set this aside, this time, to gather within with each other, to be taught the Word of God for encouragement, for strength, for rebuke, reproof, with all long suffering. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We pray that your Spirit will grace us now with his wisdom, his knowledge, and his understanding as we search the scriptures in these vital points of the word of God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, Romans 8, 28. And we're going to look at that verse of scripture from there until the end, which is verse 39. So let me put that on the board. Here. That's Romans 8, 28 to 39. Now, even though we're going to deal with the main point of this from verse 34, because 35 and further uh, enforces the perseverance of the saints of God. The perseverance, the word itself means God keeps us. God protects us. He endures with us that we cannot lose our salvation. We cannot lose our salvation. That's what verse 34c all the way up to the last verse 39. But, let, but follow me first in verse 28 as we begin our reading today. Paul speaking to the believers in Christ. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, words of caution here. You hear how people saying, God will provide, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. See, we got to be careful that we don't be caught up in the prosperity and certain word, word movement and all that and dealing with analyzing and understanding the scriptures. Okay? You got to be careful. Because we don't want the scriptures to mean something else. Because God will provide, God will provide me a home, a family, a, a marriage, a money, a bank account, and etc. And we go on and on and on. But you see, when it says Jehovah Jari or Jehovah Shalom, and many others, the Jehovah is my banner, the Jehovah is my shepherd, Jehovah, see, all that points to salvation only. In salvation and the results of salvation. But the way the church has it now is that the average person can claim Jehovah Jireh. He's my banner. He's my, he's my peace. He's, he's with me. God is good. Oh, bless the Lord. God bless me. See, people feel, seem to feel that because they no longer drink or take drugs anymore, they no longer do bad things. They start helping people. 
they start providing and helping the poor or those who are misunfortunate. They give money to St. Jude or the Children's Hospital, which is good. But they are relying that God will take this in account, that they'll it'll get them to heaven. This is this is the church is guilty of pushing this, and it's wrong. So when we see here in verse 28, all things work together for the good. It has to be established that in the life of a true believer, whatever falls in our lives, God knew it was, would, and he planned it for it to happen. And he gives us the grace to go through it. So you that are struggling with diabetes, cancer, lung disease, any kind of disease, body movement, body problems, trials and tribulations, all this has already been planned in your Christian life while you're here on earth. Nothing new is new to us because we didn't know it was going to happen. See, we didn't walk to the doctor, go to the doctor, uh, or, or whatever the doctor says, well, we got to cut this out, we got to turn this around, we got to fix this, you got to have a knee implant, you know. Uh, this is the reason why you're losing your hair. This is why you're depressed. This is why you're going through this and whatever. See, God knew this was going to happen to us. So that's why these scriptures are put in place. But you see, there's other scriptures that, 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 that we, we rely on that we look at and say, well, the Lord will never forsake us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. See, when we read those scriptures and meditate on them, it, it confirms, it reconfirms or confirms to us that God is our healer. He will heal us if it's his will. See, some of us will let, stay in the wheelchair or crutches or be will be going through what we're going through maybe the rest of our lives if it's God's will. Yeah. He can take you out of it. He can heal you. There's no such thing as perfect life, perfect healing, and oh, you should be spontaneous and joyful all the time. That's not true. You're not going to be joyful every day. But the scripture does tell us the joy of the Lord is our strength. It didn't say you're going to be joyous every day. Oh, reflect upon the Lord. The Lord is good. The Lord is... Yes, He is good. But what we take as good is, is when tragedy comes, tragedy in the, in the mind of God is good in the life of a believer. You see, the scripture says the death of a believer is blessed in the sight of God. Revelation. So it's this, the pain, the sickness, the struggles, the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations, the hurt, the setbacks, circumstances, circumstances, situations in our relationships, in our marriages, in our home, in our business life, in our employment life, in our personal life. When anything comes into our lives, Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for the good. It makes us to become more like Christ. It perfects us into more like Christ. And that work won't stop until either we die or Jesus comes back. Yeah. There's no such thing as a free, a body free from sin, free from pain, free from sickness, trials, tribulations, circum you, we will always have it. Some of us got it more than others. Right. Everybody has bills. I mean, even if you're rich and well off, you're going to have bills. It's, it's a matter of taking care of those bills or the money. We see, the problem exists is that we that do not have money, we struggle to get or, or work or whatever to get the money to, you know, to pay the bills, but everybody got bills. Everybody got problems, trials, and tribulations. 
There's no free antidote. There's no free life of anything. We want. See, the world pushes happiness. What the world needs now is love. Sweet. We need happiness. Let us love it. See, without God in your life, none of this can be true. Happiness is knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Peace is knowing Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you will not come to me that you might have peace. In the world, you will have trials and tribulations, but be ye of good comfort. I have overcome the world. You will overcome the world. So these verses of scriptures point to the believer in Christ. But notice in verse, um, as we read, for we know, Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. You have an understanding of God. You know God in a personal, personal way. Many people say, oh, I love God. I, well, are you keeping his commandments? See, remember now, Jesus broke the commandments down to two, from ten to two. He says, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your being, and to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the laws and the prophets. You do all this, you obey. To them who are the called according to his purpose. God has a decree, has a purpose, and he calls certain individuals. It's, the word is called elect or ek, ek, the Greek word is ek lego. The word ek in the Greek means out, out of. He called us out. Throughout the scriptures, God has been calling people out, out of their country, out of their land, out of their own lives, out of their sinfulness. Called, ek, lego, called, elect, according to his purpose. Now, in the chain, I'm writing on the board here, and I'm linking each chain, and each word is going to be hooked up to each one. It's a chain. Now, I'm, I'm grouping it different. A chain is a long chain. Of course, on the board, I can't make it long, because I don't have a long board. There's Brother Joseph there. Uh, in Africa has, but I got got to use what I got, okay? But here we have that each word, as we're going to go through verse 28 and 29 especially, it's called the golden chain of salvation. It, it, it hooks and it's secure together. We are, believers in Christ are so secured in Christ. I give unto you eternal life and you shall never perish. No believer will ever stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment bar of God to give account of their sin. Their sin or their sins. We will never be ushered unto eternal death, which is the second death. That means the second death is you will die a death that is eternal, meaning that you're never coming back. You're gone. All those who do not know Christ as Savior will face that. But you as a believer will live forever because you have life. Life is in Christ. If you have Christ, you have life. If you don't have Christ, you have not life. So let's look at this. Number one, we see here in the chain right here, <clears throat> we have the word that every believer has been called. That's the first link. 
We've been called according to his purpose. See that in verse, the ending of verse 28. Not all are called into salvation. Only whom God loves that he wants that individual to spend eternity with him are they called. It's called, the word itself is approbation. Let me write that on the word the board here. It's the word approbation. Okay, A P P R O B A T I O N. Again, A P P R O B A T I O N. Approbation. The word itself means those whom God loves. Approbation. Those whom God loves. That's the reason why he called you. Now. <clears throat> he called. Chosen. Elect. For his purpose. He has a reason. He has so decreed for his own purpose, for his own glory. You had nothing to do with it. You had no say in it. And that that's to some people that's not they feel that's not fair. I want something to do with it. I want something to say. What what if I don't want to be bothered with it? Trust me. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. Okay. Called. Chosen. Elect. Now, this, this has been from the foundation of the world. There's plenty of passages of scripture, but there's only two I want to focus on. I mean, it's scattered throughout the Pauline epistles and the Petrine epistles. Petrine mean Peter in which Peter and Paul uh, tells us. But to show you these two scriptures, we see in Ephesians, let's turn to that, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to abbreviate the word E-P-H. That's Ephesians 1, verses 1 to, uh, let me see here. Let's say 6. Let's look at that one first. Ephesians. you have any questions? You agree to let me know now. Paul. It's amazing how many who claim to be Christians don't want to accept Paul as an apostle. And this is one of the reasons why that Paul in his writing, he puts his salutation at the beginning, unlike what we do at the end, sincerely yours. But here Paul puts his salutation at the beginning to vindicate that God called him. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus to the faithful in Christ Jesus. See, all the saints in, in Ephesus are faithful because you've been blessed. Grace to you and peace you have peace now. See, you were at hostility at one point, but you have peace now. From God, our Father, and from the Lord, Adonijah, Jesus Christ. Here it is, verse 3. Blessed the God 
and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. See, people take that word spiritual blessing as healing and prosperity, money, food, bank account, money, job, prosperity, good home, good life, all the eatings, all the blessings, good clothes. And they say, oh, I'm blessed by God. I, I got good health. I ain't been sick and I ain't, you know, even. No, that's, that has, it says spiritual blessings. Notice what it says. Verse 4. According to According to what? What we just left in verse uh, 28, at the end of verse Romans 8, 28. According to his what? According to, according as he has chosen us, called us, elected us, in him before the creation of all things, for the foundation of the world, the translation. Before God made the heavens, before God made the earth, before God made anything, He chose the elect. He chose the elect. Tucked away in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 46, you might want to write this, Isaiah 46 and verse 5, I'm skipping 46 and 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remembering the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Isaiah 46 and 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, I said, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. That's Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. I am God. There's none beside me. Chapter 44 of Isaiah, chapter 45, just read it. He repeats himself. I am God. If there is another God, I don't know of any. And he says that. Isaiah says this. I alone am Jehovah, the almighty God. If there are other gods, I am the almighty. There is no other God. So... God mapped out everything before the foundation of the world. He has elected, called certain individuals to spend eternity with him. Now in our previous <clears throat> class today, we talked about the five points of Calvinism, the five points of Arminianism. It's still on the board here. And we looked at unconditional election, limited atonement, the total depravity of man, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints, which is called tulip. R.C. Sproul says it should be ruler. The word R is rooted instead of totally depravity, but whichever. But God from the foundation of the world, all what has happened, many, many years ago, I mean this was about 20 years ago, I went to the Enoch Pratt Library and I bought, they were selling books at that time, and I bought for I think a dollar a big thick history book. And it covers ancient history all the way down to 1980, 85. Wow, that's a lot of history. And as I went through reading all of that, I said, wow, that's a lot of history. 
it, what it, it shows us that all what had happened, all that is is happening, and all that will happen, God knew. He planned, allowed, and perfected. Because he is the sovereign God. Sovereignty means in control. I have all authority. I have all power. So, when he says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, without blame, before him in love. He not only that, look at verse 5. He predestined. Now that's, I think, that's the second word. Let me go back to our text here in Romans. Because predestined is in there too. Romans 8, 28, 29. Yeah, that's in verse 29. So let me just go ahead and write these words in this chain here as we see it in Romans chapter 8 uh, verse 28 and 29 because that covers the chain of salvation. He called, verse 28, and in that calling, in that calling, I'm going to go ahead, he for me, or what we would call He foreknew, or what, what we would call foreknowledge. Let's put that word in there. Sorry for scribbling in there, okay? He foreknew. And then we see, I'm lo looking at verse 29, Romans 8, 29 now. For whom he did foreknew, he also predestined. Right? And notice now, all this is linked together now. For whom he foreknew, them he also predestined. And he gives the reason why he predestined in order to conform us to the image of his son. Moreover, whom he predestined, verse 30, them he also called, the word call is used again. He called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Them he also justified, he glorified. Ah, okay, so here we have the completeness of Romans 8, 28 to verse uh, 30. All right? Now let's take a look at that, as we already did in Ephesians. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father, I mean Ephesians, I'm sorry, Ephesians, um, I mean, Ephesians chapter 1, I'm back to there. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that according as he has called, I'm sorry, God the Father, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he has made us acceptable or accepted in the beloved. That's a lot from verses 1 through uh, verse uh, 6. Ephesians 1, 1 to 6. All right. Now, when we, when, we, when we look at our text right now, back to Romans 8, I'm sorry that I'm flipping back and forth because the, the reason is is because the scriptures has to... Get, uh, validate scriptures, has to interpret scripture. 
Right. Because I'm trying to see, we have to keep ourselves out, our, our teachings, our learning, our book learning away from what the scripture teaches. Because they conflict. Our, our knowledge and our book learning, according to our beliefs, can conflict with, with scriptures. And that's why you have to interpret scripture as scriptures. Okay? So, he, in the beginning, he called. And he foreknew. In other words, see, God foreknowledge is not, N-O-T, it is not that God looked down throughout the corridors of time and saw you and I and say, oh, he will believe, he will not believe. Oh, he's going to get saved. And why so? Because I looked down and I saw that individual had faith in me. See, that's the teaching of the Arminians. The election is based on foreseen faith. That God saw down the future that we will get saved. That's not how God elect people. Election is, is from the foundation of the world. God chose us before the foundation of the world. He called us before the foundation of the world. He established all who we are, how and when and where we will be saved from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> you have to remember that God is in control. All that did happen, is happening, and will happen is under the controlling allowance of God. He foreknew all what will happen. He knows when you're going to die, how you're going to die, where you was born, when you're going to be born, what color your skin, what nationality, what you're going to believe in, where you're going to teach, who you're going to marry, everything. Every iota of every human being that ever had lived or will live God planned and knew. As the old Clint Eastwood movies would say, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> right, I mean, I'm, I have to say that, okay? Because whether it's good, bad, or ugly, profound, evil, wicked, or whatever, God knew. See, nothing takes God by surprise. That's why it is, the scripture says, I am the Almighty. I am the sovereign God. I plan perfect. I know. There's not one fly that falls to the ground that God does not know about. Every animal that a lion catches, a deer, when he catches a deer, or when the, when the monkey takes bananas off the tree, or when a bee flies back to the site, and, 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 and pushes the honey out of his backside into the, the honeycomb, God knew. Every, every plant that grows and dies, before there was time, God knew that would happen. Every thundercloud, every, every flood, every killing, every, every abortion, every incest, every problem, every trial, every sickness, every pain, God knew, but he allowed and he planned. Now, to us in the human mind, we sit back and say, that's a whole lot. See, that's why he's the sovereign God. <laughs> okay. Because it would break our minds and heart to sit back and, 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 and meditate on that. And that's why I gave you Isaiah 46 verses 9 and 10. I am God. There's no other. From the beginning of time, I planned, I perfected. Even the ancient things, all what had happened and will happen, I knew. I planned it, I perfected it, I allowed it. Whether it's good, tragedy, bad, evil, wicked, whatever you want to call it, in our terminology, God says, I am in control. Anything. Anything in our universe, in our system, in our life pattern that happens, God is in control. 
Now, there are, I think there are, what, three, five, three to five billion people on this earth, I think, maybe more, maybe less. Can you imagine God controlling the hearts and life of individuals? And I'm not even talking about animal life, plant life, bird life, <laughs> okay, the fishes. Can you imagine the nine planets in our solar system is kept in a distance by the power of God? Can you imagine as all the nine planets circling the, the, the one big star called the sun, and as it circles, it rotates around as it circles every planet, and he's keeping it in order. No, there is no block, there's no noble, there's no eclipse, lunar eclipse, and supernovas. That's when a planet or a star, really a star, gets so heated and, and becomes so heated that it just either explodes or it turns into a black hole that it sucks everything into it. God says, yes, I'm in control of that. So when you're dealing with the sovereignty of God in all this perspectives, it is a whole lot. So he called, he foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. Now we spoke on the word foreknowledge here in Ephesians. Did you mention that in Ephesians? No, that's in Peter. Turn your Bibles now to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. And we look at the word for new or for knowledge. Now in our text in Romans, while you turn into Peter, I'm reading in, in our text here that in verse 29 it says, For whom he did foreknow, he predestined. So we got call for new predestined. So that's where we at now, for new. What is the foreknowledge of God? Any questions so far? First Peter chapter one verse two. Now Peter is speaking to the Christians in the upper region of Asia. Over on the west, the east, east and west side of what we call Russia and China. <laughs> yeah, that's where Peter went at. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the to the strangers. We are strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Alec, et lego, chosen ones, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctification, and we, you know, the sanctification is not on here, but we're going to talk about sanctification. In his three processes, the word itself means to be set apart. Okay. Through the sanctification of the Spirit, and that's what the Spirit of God does. In that first process, when you, we, you and I are saved, and those that are saved, he sets us apart from sin, Satan, and the world unto himself. That's what the word sanctify, the root sanctification, the root word is sanctify. He sets us apart. Through the sanctification of the Spirit unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Wow. So here we have the word, once again, as in Romans 8.29, foreknowledge. Foreknowledge means to know something or have knowledge of something beforehand. For. Beforehand. Foreknowledge. So we have called, 
foreknowledge, he foreknew. This is the golden chain here of salvation. And each step by step, God provided salvation for the elect, the church. The church is those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Those whom God has chosen from the foundation of the world. That as history takes its part, individuals are drawn by the Holy Spirit of God, convicted by the Holy Spirit of God, until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Any questions? Back to Romans 8 again. The chain of salvation. All this involves our great salvation. As Hebrew tells us, <clears throat> Hebrews 2, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Verse 29, Romans 8, 29. Whom he did foreknow, the scripture says now, whom, now watch it now, here it is. Well, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine or predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son and his likeness. Many people, sad to say many Christians, have a uh, misunderstanding or they do not know about the, full, the uh, well, foreknowledge of God or the word itself predestination. How can God do that? How can he predestine? Now, let me read you something. Dealing with God's predestination, his decree, and his foreknowledge. God, from all eternity, did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely, unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. He decreed. Hmm. So we have the word decree, we have the word foreknowledge, predestined. Now the word, the root word here we have is pre. P R E, predestinate. Pre. The word pre means before. The word destinate, it means where you're going. It, 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 it shows us that God, before time, before any, before the foundation of the world, before He created anything, He planned and perfected. He predestined those who will spend eternity with him. Hmm. Now, here's the, here's the argumental part of that word, which even as Christians, many don't want to accept. It's called double predestination. Now, I know it's an argument on that, but there's scripture. That's why the scripture says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Romans chapter uh, 9. What that calls us as we read that, that the scripture says that before the boys, they were twins, before they were born, they was in their mother's womb. 
The scripture says in Romans chapter 9 that God had already decreed, foreknew, called, determined beforehand out of the two boys, one he wants, one he don't want. Now, that staggers the mind of us because we cannot comprehend why God made such a choice. But you see, that's why I gave you Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. I am God. I am solving it. See, you, you, you cannot say to God, what are you doing? How come you're doing that? You can't do that. All that is this in Romans chapter 9 and in Malachi chapter 3. See, it's Malachi 3 and, and Romans 9. See, in the Old Testament, the children of God were saying to God, that's not fair. You're not just. And God spoke back to the people of Israel through the prophet, I'm not just. How is it that I'm not just? I'm not fair. What do you mean? So in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 9, the problem came up again. You can't do that. you got to choose everybody. No, everybody should go to heaven. It's not fair that some go and some don't. God sits back in Malachi and in Romans 9 and says, I am God. I am the almighty God. I am sorry. I do, see that's why it says in Isaiah 46, I do as I please. I am not governed by laws. I'm not governed by your choices or your decisions. My ways is not your way. My thoughts are not your thoughts. What we appeal to, what we feel that it is right and just is not the same as God. That's why I said my ways are not your ways. Isaiah 55. But we're determined to make God come down to us to think like we think, to do as we do. God says, no, I am God. I am the creator. You are my creation. I, I am God. You are man. What I do I am not governed by law because if, a, if there is a law that will govern me, I cannot be solvent. If there is something out there that's going hayward or contrary and I don't know about it, I can't be all-powerful and all-knowing. You follow me? So therefore, we can't say to God, what are you doing? That's not fair. Did not you say in your word that you love all the world, that you gave your only begotten son? God points out, that's what you say. That's your way of thinking. That's your thoughts. I didn't say that. That's your understanding. Your belief. Because the scriptures interpret itself because the word world, it means whosoever. Not encompass everyone. And, but, you so, but you see, it's so knitted in our Christian society that the average preacher would say, God loves you. God wants to save you. God wants to make you a part of his life. God has a plan. See, you ever hear this on the social media and TV? God has a plan for you. I mean, they're talking to the unsaved. God loves you, and he wants to redeem you. He wants you to come out of your filth and come out and, 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 and join him. God has a perfect plan for your life. But there's no, that sounds good. But that's not scripture. It's just like the scripture, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens, I will come. Where is that? that we use, people use that, preachers preach that, with such misunderstanding. God is not, Jesus is not knocking at the door of a heart of an individual. 
Can you let me in? See, right there you should think, wait a minute. You are not strong enough to penetrate my heart. Why you got to knock? Come on in. You know, if, I, if that's my house, I'm coming in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Well, you such an almighty God, come on in. See, that's the frailty of the understanding of man. That scripture does not mean that. Then, well, what about the scripture? Whosoever will, let him come. See, that sounds, see, in the human mind, whosoever will, let him come. But you see, we fail to understand about the will of man. It is not free. It's not free towards God. It's free towards a house, a home, a car, a job, a college, a career. Oh yeah, human stuff. But towards God, they that in the flesh cannot please God. Your will is tainted by sin. Your heart is deceitful and desperate and wicked. Your mind is dull. Your ears is closed. Your feet run swift to mischief. Your mouth is always lying and tallitating. Every part of us is affected by sin. So what does it mean, whosoever will, let him come? How do we have, how can we have, or how can we have the will to come? Here it is. See, that's why scripture has to interpret scripture. How? Well, John 6 says, no man has the ability, the will, to come to me unless I draw him. See, we, what we do is we snatch a scripture, we pull out a scripture, we snatch it here, we snatch it there, and we make a teaching, we make a doc. You can't do that. You, you, and churches are getting away with this. The preacher is doing this. The teachers, Sunday school class, teachers are doing it. And this is wrong. Scripture must interpret scripture. No one has the will to come to God unless God first draw him. And you cannot get saved unless God first, first draw you, regenerate your heart and mind first. Because regeneration precedes, comes before repentance and faith. Now, I, I, I caught a glimpse of that. And I read and I said, wait a minute, what are they talking about? No, you got to believe and repent, then you get saved, then you regenerate, then you're born again. Well, how are you going to repent and believe when your heart and my, everything about you is deceitful and desperately wicked and evil and sinful? Something has to happen to you before you repent and believe the gospel. But so that's why it's tucked away in the scriptures in John 6 where it says we three times three times no man can come to the Father unless I draw him. So you can't have a, your will your will is contaminated tainted by sin. Your mind your heart is under control of sin. So unless I first draw you, change your mind, change your heart, and cause you to realize that you have broken my law, that you are a sinner, that once that happens, then you can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Unless that happens, you can't get saved. That's what predestined nation is all about. And it is in God's decree, God's will. That's his plan. Of, see, that's why it's called salvation, deliverance. Jehovah saves. Jehovah Jari, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord will provide. But he must provide. Now, next week, we're going to do a sort of in-depth look at, and we're going to pause at this word predestined because 
it's, it can get out of hand and tricky in the human mind. So we're going to look at the predestination again with the sovereignty of God and move on to being called, justified, and glorified. So keep your notes and we'll come to that. Let's look to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you for the, the class today and defining your sovereignty, your power, who you are, and what you had done, are doing, and will do, which has been already decreed, planned, predestined. Blessed is the name of you, O Lord, for all what you have done. And grant it so that we as Christians may search the scriptures and understand the truths of your word. Rise up men who will stand firm to the truths of thine word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, 11.30, we're going to come back with you guys. Okay, you that are audible, come back with you guys, okay? Right. Eleven thirty is our worship service. We'll come back at eleven thirty for our uh, closing worship service. Where's your gray suit, Miss Carol? Mm -hmm. About a quarter of one something like that. Yeah. You got the address? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. Come a little bit for it, too.